Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. It's the first physical meeting for almost a year, so it's exciting. Um, and this animal that you see here, that's not a porpoise, uh, it's a right whale. But we switch to the porpoises now. Uh, and in the waters around Sweden, we have three harbor porpoise populations. Uh, it's the North Sea population, found in a big area out here. There are about 350,000 animals. Uh, the Belt Sea population here, in a much smaller area. There are a bit more than 40,000 animals, uh, but the density is about the same here. And then we have uh, the Baltic proper harbor porpoise population, and that's a very sad story with only a few hundred individuals left, and they are found in the inner Baltic Sea. Mm. And the threats to the Baltic proper harbor porpoise population that's bycatches, where the estimated bycatch level is much higher than the uh, limit that they can take. They can't even take one animal per year, so in, uh, like anthropogenic mortality. Environmental pollutants, such as PCBs, uh, they cause reproductive failure and immunosuppression. And then there's underwater noise, and the rest of this presentation is about underwater noise. Uh, possible also changes in prey quantity and quality impacts them. And the knowledge status uh, on the impact of underwater noise on harbor purposes. Um, as uh, Peter and Matthias introduced that we have impulsive noise and continuous noise. So more uh, bangs and this is more like going on all the time like ship noise. And the harbor porpoises, it's actually one of the species where we have most information on impact uh, of impulsive noise on the local level or on the individual level. Although there are just a few studies, studies published on impact of continuous noise. And then when we move up, as I think Matthias mentioned, what does it mean on the population level or regional level? We know very, very little. There are kind of modeling approaches, uh, so trying to translate the information for this lower level to the high level, but here the knowledge level is much, much lower so far. And yeah, at the end of this presentation, uh, we, I will present some results from a study, uh, impact of continuous noise on the local level on harbor purposes in Swedish waters. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, the echolocation, hearing and avoidance behavior of harbor porpoises. So porpoises, they're really the primary sense that's hearing, that's super important to them. They kind of live in a world of sound and now noise also nowadays. And they echolocate and they use really high frequency signals that we can't hear with our, uh, our ears. Um, but if you yeah, this is uh, frequency modulated, so it's kind of tuned down, so it, it is audible, made audible to us. And if you please could play that. Thanks. So what they do is that they emit clicks, stereotypic clicks, and they're actually at the same frequency each click but they can change the time interval between the clicks. So when, there's, there's very, when it goes in this recording, it's actually still the same frequency, but the time interval is so short, and that's called a bus, and it's uh, probably focusing kind of a fish very close to it that is about to take and eat. Mm. And those uh, echolocation signals, they are up here, at 130 kilohertz, and that can't be heard by us at all. Um, but they do hear a very, very wide range of sounds and noise. Um, yeah, so that is, what this is an audiogram of harbor purpose. And here we have frequency, so from low pitch sound to high pitch sound, and here is a sound pressure level. So these are weak sounds and these are loud sounds. So actually the question before about what's important, frequency and or decibel, here you have them both. And if you, for example, take a tone of one kilohertz, to be able to be audible for purpose, it must be above approximately 80 decibels. So it hears everything above this curve, 
but it doesn't hear anything below this curve. And if we add lots of dots here, uh, they are from different studies looking at when avoidance behavior has begun on, in harbor porpoises, when they've showed that. that. And there are many different so sound sources, but they found that when you pile them up or put them up together like this, it seems like the porpoise reacts stereotypically by avoiding noise if it exceeds the hearing threshold by approximately 40 to 50 decibel. So this is just an approximate avoidance reaction threshold. And that's very useful to have that relationship. Mm -hmm. And this is an example how harbor porpoises can react to underwater noise. Uh, it's a porpoise in Danish waters that has been equipped with lots of different instruments. So everything is recorded on the harbor porpoise. Um, and in the upper graph here, we have the sound or the noise that the porpoise hears at a specific frequency. So in general, it's fairly, we'll say, uh, the same. Some peaks here and there, but then something very noisy happens here. And the lower graph, uh, that's in the top bar. Uh, the black bars here, up there, they are when the analysts could hear ship noise when they were listening to the recording. And the yellow bar here, that's when they could hear a high-speed ferry. And that was uh, estimated to be, at the closest, about seven kilometers from the harbor porpoise. So then this is what the porpoise is doing. This is uh, at the surface, and this is 30 meters depth. So it dives, goes up to the surface and breathe, uh, to breathe, and dives down again. It's blue, where the porpoise do, do regular clicks, so it's kind of looking around in the environment by doing these regular clicks. And the red parts is when it's buzzing, so it's foraging, trying to catch a fish to eat. So you see that it's virtually looking around all the time, uh, and it's eating very, very often, especially when it's close to the bottom. But then when it starts hearing the uh, high-speed ferry, it goes quiet. It's not blue here anymore. Uh, and it changes its diving behavior completely. And it also stops eating. And it takes 15 minutes from when it hears the ferry until it resumes kind of normal behavior again. Uh, so it's a very, very strong reaction to a loud ship far away. And also here, when it doesn't click and look around, if it had been swimming by a fishing net, it wouldn't have been able to detect it, as it doesn't kind of see with its echolocation. So then it would have drowned. Um, yeah, but all ships are not this loud. Uh, kind of more normal ships. It's been found that porpoises in general start changing their uh, direction of movement when they're about one kilometer away from the ship. Mm -hmm. And then in the Baltic Sea, it's even more challenging to study the harbor porpoise uh, as there are so few. So we have very, very low density. So it's, it's difficult to do it even on the local level. So we have to uh, kind of get data from other places and uh, apply that to the Baltic Sea. But you can't, as uh, Peter and Matthias explained, that the environment is different. Uh, and with the lower salinity of the, of the Baltic Sea, sound propagates longer distances, especially sound of free, higher frequencies. Uh, so if you have an impact distance from the North Sea, it will be much longer in the Baltic Sea, most probably, depending on what kind of noise source it is. Uh, and also, as we have so few purposes left, there is not room for mistakes. If we do something uh, that kind of reduces the reproduction for a year or two, then we may wipe out the whole population. And if we wipe out this population, we don't have any purposes anymore in the Baltic Sea at all. Uh, and also, when I talk about impact distances, it can range from, for example, uh, a pinger, uh, which is a uh, porpoise deterrent thing. You put it on a fishing net with the aim of scaring porpoises away from the net so they don't drown, get caught and drown in the net. They deter porpoises hundreds of meters. While if you pile drive, as uh, Peter and Maxi Matthias gave examples to, pile driving deter porpoises within 20 kilometers in the North Sea, and movements have been measured up to 50 kilometers. Uh, and those distances are probably longer in the Baltic Sea. So it can be huge impact zones. 
Mm -hmm. So where are the porpoises and where is the noise in the Baltic Sea? Uh, first, the porpoises. Uh, this is an acoustic survey. For two years we had instruments, all EU countries uh, cooperated in this, so we had instruments uh, placed out here listening for the porpoises, because there are so few so you can't look for them. Um, and yeah, if we start with August, uh, the, uh, the porpoises in the Baltic proper, they uh, gather here around the offshore banks. Uh, and this was a proposed management border by this project uh, of the summer management border of the Baltic proper harbour porpoise. And here in the southwestern Baltic Sea, with a higher density, that's Belt Sea harbour porpoises. And the white areas were not surveyed. They are deeper than 80 meters. And then in February, so in winter, they spread out much more, more along the coasts. Some Baltic proper porpoises seem to live into the southwestern part of the Baltic Sea. Uh, and there's no spatial separation between the two populations. And based on these results, uh, Sweden designated this huge protected site for harbour porpoises and also some other species and habitats. Uh, but so far, it's still kind of just a paper park. Uh, it's no special protection in there. Uh, and the noise. Uh, these two maps shows uh, the locations of uh, uh, impulsive noise events. So it doesn't show the noise. It, show, it just shows where they took place. And the green squares, that's where noise took place during the last five years in the Baltic Sea. And the maps are examples because then they're classified of the yeah, noise source. So this is an example of the very low class and this is a high class. But the important thing here is that uh, the distribution range of the noise events really overlaps with the porpoise distribution range and also with this core area for the in a critical endangered population. And Pieter showed a similar map to this. Uh, this is ship noise uh, together with natural sounds. And it's orange where it's elevated due to ship noise. And this is on frequencies that are audible to porpoises on this map. And again, it overlaps uh, where the ship noise is with where the porpoises are. Mm -hmm. And this I'll just say very quickly, uh, because I think it's important, but we can't go into any details. Um, the upper table here, uh, that's for the big area here. That's the summer distribution range of the Baltic proper harbour porpoise. And the lower table, that's for the area here where the Baltic proper porpoise may move into, the, into winter. Uh, and it shows the number of, in green, the number of existing wind farms, uh, 3rd of January this year. And in yellow, that's the number of, uh, let's say, they have, they have been authorized, so they will be built. Uh, and then in red, in circle in red, that's the number of planned wind farms in these two areas. Uh, and all in all, we talk about almost 70 wind farms, if all these plans would uh, yeah, be realized. Uh, and if they would be built, that could have a huge impact on the marine environment and the Baltic proper harbour purpose and the whole sound soundscape. So it's super important that this is really well managed um, and also that we're using the best available technology for it. Mm. So in summary, uh, the underwater noise, the pressure, uh, it's not quiet out there. Uh, and there's a significant overlap between the core area for Baltic proper harbour purpose and where it's really noisy. And there's an increasing interest in new wind farms and also there's a predicted increase in shipping. So, yeah, we need technical improvements and regulations. And now I'll talk about uh, a project, uh, the SLIM project. It's a collaboration with FOI. Um, and the aim, for the porpoise perspective, was to yeah, estimate the impact of ship noise on harbour porpoises in this protected site in the Baltic Sea. But as I said, the uh, porpoise density is very low here. So we started by analysing data from the Swedish west coast to develop the methods there. And then we also applied the same method in the protected site here. And FY did the noise and sound measurements 
and we measured the porpoises. So these are sound recorders, and that's the porpoise detector there. Mm -hmm. But then it's tricky, because the sound recorders, they record sound. So that's both natural sounds and human noise. Uh, and we tried a very simple approach here, so to tell them apart, uh, the human noise, that's the ship noise, that we wanted to see if it had an impact, and the natural sound, that's primarily from waves that are generated by the wind. Uh, so we just said we will use wind speed as a proxy for the natural sounds. And this is my most complicated slide, <laughs> um, but I'll talk you through it. Uh, we have three kinds of dots here. Uh, the green dots, uh, that's the almost maximum sound pressure level measured in a time window of 10 minutes. Uh, and the red dots, that's the wind speed, where we have one measurement per hour. And the blue dots down here, that's a 10 minute time slot, and it's a blue dot there if porpoises were detected within that time slot. Um, so we started by lining up uh, the wind speed measurements and the sound measurements. And of course, they're measured on totally different scales, but we just lined them up so the means matched and how they were spread up also matched. Um, and then we calculated these outer borders, uh, the dotted line here, uh, and they encompass 98% of all wind measurements. And we said that if there are sound peaks outside this uh, uh, area that uh, encompasses most wind measurements, then they are most likely from ships passing by because they can't be explained by the wind speed. So we took a time window of six hours and then we measured the distance uh, from this time, or wind border, if I call it that, out to the sound measurements. And we summed all the distances we had within this six hour time window and then we also counted the number of porpoise uh, detections or slots with porpoise detections in there. And we saw if we have to investigate whether we have a correlation there or not. And actually we found overall a decreasing or negative correlation. So the, the more or the stronger or louder sound peaks there were, the fewer porpoise detections we had. And this is a normalized scale, so zero means that uh, if, if it had been a flat line at zero, uh, uh, the outlier distance here of the sound peaks would have had an impact. But here we see the more of them we have, the less porpoise detections we have. So that uh, they do seem to reduce porpoise presence, or it makes the porpoises to go quiet. And we found the same results both at the Swedish West Coast and in the Baltic Sea. Mm? Uh, and possible next steps here is that we want to see if we can find a threshold when we have fewer porpoise detections, because then we can uh, calculate how often the porpoises are being disturbed in these two different areas. And this is the same map as Matthias showed before. So as Matthias said that uh, we're doing the noise measure, or Matthias, uh, FYI, are doing the noise measurements. We also measure porpoises here. So in next autumn, we will have data on whether this uh, rerouting of the shipping lane will have impacted the purposes or not. Mm. Two take-home messages. Uh, the scientific knowledge on the impacts of underwater noise on harbor purposes is increasing rapidly. And uh, <laughs> noise is one of several threats to the Baltic proper harbor purpose population and immediate management actions are needed to secure its survival. And actually that's uh, the viewpoint of the European Commission too. In July they sent an infringement case to Sweden where they explained that Sweden has not done enough to protect harbour purposes from bycatches, but also from disturbance in the protected areas. And Sweden has three months to reply to this, so Sweden is expected to reply now in early November. Uh, so it will be very uh, interesting to hear what Sweden says about this. Thank you. <laughs>